So, Father, I thank you and I praise you with all of my heart. Lord, I ask that your word be spoken, that it be with clarity and the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that it would penetrate the mind, the body, and the soul. And Lord, that it would accomplish what you would want it to do. Lord, resulting in salvation and sanctification, the strengthening of the church, drawing people out of darkness and into your marvelous light. So Lord, I thank you and I praise you with all of my heart. May your word speak. Speak, Lord. Have your way. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. The message entitled is, Why Go to Church? Why Go to Church? Now, before I get into this, we need to understand something. In First Tim, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4, let's read this. Paul says, and speaking of the end times, the times that we are in today, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desire, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to a young Timothy of how the condition of the church would be in the last days. And I believe that we are truly in the last hour, not the last days. We are in the last hour. We see what is happening in the world. We understand that there is nothing else that needs to happen in regard to Scripture for the rapture of the church. And so we clearly understand where so many ministries worldwide have been caught up, according to what Paul says, they have been caught up in false doctrine. They've been caught up in, in, in not sound doctrine, meaning the biblical word of God. And so we have to understand, that's why I say what I say. If we're going to talk about, hey, we need to go to church, well, we need to first understand what is the church? Because a lot, I'll just speak for America here because that is where we are. But this is, this is an astounding figure. 80% of the church in America is really operating not in the biblical sound word of God. They're not. That they are, they are a false church. Now, you can say, Michael, that is crazy. No, look, l l l just bear with me and listen. Because you can clearly see that of all the churches in America, so many, and I'm not talking about the, the, the off branches, you know, of that came from the true Christian church, you know, where you make up so many different denominations. I'm talking about that, that mainstream church that says that they believe in Jesus, they believe in the cross, but yet they do, not, they do not preach the biblical word of God. And more importantly, you see that they do not live a life that is honoring to God. Now, you're not perfect, Christian. I understand that. We're not perfect. But we do, as Christians, have something within us that drives us to the holiness of God, that develops the fear of God within us. And, and we, we have a, an awe, a respect, and a love for, for the Lord and also for the church. Now, God is faithful. When Elijah, the prophet Elijah, he thought he was the only prophet left in all of Israel. And he went into a deep depression because they were about to kill him. But what does the Bible say? That as God spoke to him, God said, Elijah, I have 7,000 more just like you. Now, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of churches in America. But God is still faithful. There are a remnant of churches, not just in America, but throughout the world, who are the true church. And so when we talk about the church, when we talk about going to church, what church are you talking about? What Jesus are you talking about? Because you see, for a lot of those churches, the Jesus that they worship is not the Jesus of the Bible. It's not the Jesus of the Bible. It's not the Christianity of the Bible. We're so, they're so focused on, on bringing things of the world into the church. And that is not what the Bible teaches, how we should conduct ourselves on this earth. The Bible says, let your mind be on things above, not on things on below and on the earth. We're, we're not over here talking about, you know, well, should a Christian have tattoos or should a Christian drink or should a Christian do this or a Christian do that? Look, look, the Holy Spirit has to speak to you about these things. And, and we should have a drive within us that we are looking to heaven. Look, I know what this world has to offer. So do you. 
You know that in this world there's pain, there's misery, there's sickness, there's death. And you know what? Not just you, but I'm sick of it. And I'm tired of it. But there is something that the Bible calls the blessed hope. And what is the blessed hope? The return of Christ for his church. And so we should be looking forward to eternity. We should be looking forward to heaven. We should be looking forward to the things that God has prepared for those who love him. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for those who love him. And so we love God because he first loved us. And because we, he loves us and we love him, guess what? We love his church. And then it's a natural thing for a Bible-believing Christian to love the church, to love going to church, to being a part of fellowship. But I understand, I'm talking to you right now, but you've been burned, you've been hurt. You, you've been burned and hurt by, by churches out there that operate not in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, there is no perfect church because if there was, you and I would go and we would mess it all up. There is no perfect church but we don't go to church for people. We truly go to church because we love the Lord and the Lord is doing something in those people's lives and God has called you to be a part of that. So let me just hit it right off the bat. Are we supposed to go to church? Yes, we are. Why? I'm gonna tell you why. For the next two hours, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. For, for the next moments, I wanna talk biblically about why church is important. Being connected to the body of Christ is so important. Why? Because, because the Bible talks about being connected to the body. The, we're, we're not, there are not different parts of the body that are more important than others. We're all equally important. We all play a part in this. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean that I have a greater responsibility and a greater reward than you do if you're not a pastor. We are all equal in the eyes of God, Christian. We all have a, a, a responsibility. We are obligated to Christ. We are obligated to fulfill what God has put in our hearts. All of us have time, talent, and treasure. We have different opportunities, but we all have those things. And we are called to be faithful, especially the time that we're in. Look, the world is prime. It's ready. The world believes in spiritualism. But the false church is giving them the wrong Jesus. And that's why we see the corruption in America in our politics because this is a result of a lukewarm church when, when this nation started it was a strong strong church that came and, and there was it was not perfect you know we had to go through a war to deal with slavery to end slavery up until that point slavery was rampant throughout the world and people could say well you know America was built on slavery let, let me tell you something the whole world was built on slavery up until that point but, but I, I am not going to believe the lie that says, oh, well, you know, the, the, this critical race theory and these Black Lives Matter things, you know, this is all teachings from the pits of hell. Well, why do I say that? Because the Spirit of God has revealed these things. It brings nothing but division and hate, and that's not of God. You know, you can be anything you want to be in this nation, regardless of your race, your color, or, or, or whatever it is. It does not matter. You can do anything, be anything you want to be. But when you die, where are you going? Amen. That is what is really important. We can be so busy trying to chase the dollar, being an entrepreneur, have that American entrepreneurship spirit, and yet neglect our very eternity. Okay. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We have a, 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 a woman that is being interviewed by the Senate right now who cannot, uh, for the Supreme Court, and she cannot give the definition of what it means to be a woman. And she says, I'm not a biologist. You don't have to be a biologist. The Bible says what a woman is. Even Adam, when Eve was created, he said, hey, whoa, man. That's a woman. That's what Adam said. So the first man, Adam, he knows what a woman was, is. And men, women, you know too. He said, whoa, man. God says, there you go, a woman. Amen? You can't laugh in the church. We're in trouble. <laughs> that's what, that, and I got to give my wife credit for that. My wife told me that last night. I said, that's right. 
That's why, sweetheart, when I looked at you, I said, whoa, man. I said that too. When I was a 21-year-old kid, I met my wife in 1993. That's exactly what I had in my head. Whoa, man. So, but we have people that are going to be leaders in our nation. They do not understand. But you know what? You can't blame them because most of these leaders are not, are not believers of Christ. So what do you expect? What do you expect? So our problem is not with the leadership of the nation, the po political thing. The problem is with the church. Because as the church goes, so the nation goes. So we, we have this all backwards, okay? We have this all backwards. We're, we're, we're trying to, to get the right leaders in place. Why? So we can have it go our way. That's the agenda of the other side too. It's the agenda of everybody. But what's the agenda of the Christian? that we proclaim the truth of the gospel and that we be a Bible-believing, preaching, teaching church and that we stick to the main commission. And what is that? Winning souls and raising up and sending out disciples. That is all we're called to do. Praise God if there's a Christian in the White House. But even if there's not, we're still going to do what we're called to do. What do you think the church did in the Roman times? There were definitely no Christians in the Roman uh, Caesars. They were the wickedest, evilest men that ever lived. But what did they do? The church do? They thrived. They were getting saved thousands by the daily. Why? Because they were not looking to men. They were not looking to Biden. They were not looking to Trump. They were looking to Jesus. And that's the problem with the church. We are not looking to Jesus. And we need to get looking to Jesus. What does Jesus say? When you see these things begin to happen, Luke 21, it says, lift up your head. For your redemption draws near. Jesus is coming back, not from the pits of hell. Jesus is coming back from the kingdom of heaven. And that's where your hope is found. That's where your blessing is found. That's where eternity is. And so we should be looking up. Look to Jesus. You see what men are doing. You see what's happening. Epidemics, famines, wars in the world. But you look up to Jesus. You look up to Jesus. This is the gospel. This is what is missing in the pulpit of the church worldwide. The unctioning of the Holy Spirit. Now, don't be uh, tricked by wise, persuasive words that come from a preacher and Holy Spirit preaching. Don't be tricked by those things. There's a lot of good, talented, crafty charlatans in the pulpits today. And they have a political agenda. And they're greedy for money. They're greedy for power. Why do you think they're trying to shut the church in America down, the church of Jesus in America down? Because politicians know that all power is in the church of Christ. And that's what they want, whether they're Republican or Democrat or Independent. They want power. And they know the real power is in the church of the land. That's why Jesus says the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. And that's why they're coming against the church, because if they can shut the church and remove the church, then they can, to their perverted minds, they think they have the power then. And that is why we need to separate ourselves and be for Christ alone. I'm telling you, I'm no prophet, but I too hear the voice of the Lord. And we have but a very short time left. A very short time. We must be about the work of our Father as Christ was. And so woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Woe to those who claim to be Christian and claim to be followers of Christ, but you're sleeping in your bed when the church gathers. If you're sleeping in your bed, if you're doing your own agenda when the church gathers, when the rapture happens, you think you're going to get caught up? Christ is coming back for the faithful. Jesus said, when I return, how much faith shall I find on the earth? He's not coming back for the Baptists or the Pentecostals or the holiness. He's coming back for the bride of Christ. Amen. For those who are purchased by the blood of, of the Lamb. For those who said, I don't need this world. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. They say, I don't go to church because the people there are hypocrites. Well, congratulations, so are you. You go to a hospital because there are a lot of sick people there. And so it is with the church of Christ. There are a lot of sick people. You come as you are, but you're not going to be the same. Because the Holy Spirit will transform you. He will save you. The name of Jesus will save you, but the Holy Spirit will transform you. Now, I'm not here doing theatrics, but I'm here preaching from my heart. You know, I don't need to convince you. But, but we are messengers of the gospel. 
You know, I, I, did, I, I, I'm, I made peace in my heart a long time ago. I said, Lord, I don't need to be a part of a mega church. I need to be a part of the pure church. I was once part of a denomination after my training. They could have sent me to a church from the East Coast to the West Coast. But I left it. And my wife and I, the Holy Spirit, started this little church in our living room 15 years ago this coming June. And, and, and that's what happens for a lot of preachers. They want to see the, a big, mighty church. They want to see, no. The Lord said, no, you want a pure church. You want a church that's focused on him. And so for many that are watching online and many that might be in this room today, you, you may not be comfortable with what I'm saying. But I assure you, it's rooted in the word of God. Because you don't want to hear what I have to say. You want to hear what the Lord has to say. Now look, in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, this is what the unknown writer of Hebrews says. And let us consider, now read this with me, please. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is this habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. All of what I just said, there it is. Again, let's read it again. I think it's worth reading again. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. He's talking about believers. As believers, we are to encourage each other to honor God. We're to encourage and strengthen each other to honor God. Look, not forgetting, not forsaking, look, not forgetting, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. Some believers are in the habit and it's a bad habit and it can become a dangerous habit when you just say, ah, I'll go when I, when I got time. I'll go when, uh, that is a bad habit. There are good habits and there are bad habits. Habits are not necessarily bad. This is not good but encourage one another as you see the Lord is coming soon. Now, why do we come to church? Because first of all, the Bible says we need to do this. We need to do this. Now, I want to read a statement to you and we're going to pull it up here. And this is what is written. Look, it is not biblical to not go to church. Every letter in the New Testament assumes Christians are members of local churches. The letters themselves are addressed to local churches. They teach us how to get along with the other members, how to encourage the weak within the church, how to conduct ourselves at church, and what to do with unrepentant sinners in the church. They command us to submit to our elders and encourage us to go to our elders to pray. All these things are impossible if you aren't a member of a local church. Now, here's the thing. You want to be a part of the true church and not the false church. And so it begins with, Lord, lead me to a Bible-believing, preaching, teaching church, Amen. to a Holy Spirit-filled church. You got to be willing to leave religion. You have to be willing to leave what man says and to be led by the Spirit. The Bible says that the wind comes and goes, and so it is with the Spirit of God, that He'll lead you and that's what he did with Abraham. He said, Abraham, get up, go to this place. And Abraham got up and he left. It's the spirit of God who has always led the people of God. Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. Jesus said, I will send you the Holy Spirit. The book of Revelation, it says, those who have an ear, let them hear what the Holy Spirit says to the church. That's right now. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. But are you willing to listen? Are you willing to obey? Yeah, I love Pastor Michael, but he's not my savior. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. How do you know I haven't been entertained by devils this past week? You need to keep your eyes on Jesus. And don't ever say, I'll never fail you, God, because I'll start calling you Peter. We need to walk one day at a time with the Lord Jesus. We need to trust him daily to meet our every needs. That's why we have all in this church, we have a habit of saying, if the Lord wills. We'll do this next week and do that if the Lord is willing. Because by not doing that, we're putting ourselves ahead of God. And we could very well go up in glory. I would love that. Amen. But we don't know 
when our last day, when our last hour. Take a breath. That's as close as you are to eternity. Amen. Are you ready? Are you ready? Because it's that fast. It's that fast. Now, here are some reasons, as, before I get back into Scripture, here are some reasons that, actually, here's 15 of them, of things that people will say why they do not go to church. N number one, I mean, not number one, but the first one that I brought up was, was being hypocrite. But here's number one. I can get better preaching from a podcast. And you know, sadly, that's true. Because what have I, what have I told you? There are a lot of false churches out there, but there are some good ministers and there are some, God is faithful. He still has a remnant of churches out there. And there are some good ministers out there. Number two, I can worship on my own. Really? How's that going for you? Because I know for me, iron sharpens iron. I need help. If I'm out of fellowship with the church, I'll be out of fellowship eventually with Christ. You don't believe me? Keep going the way you're going. In my 15 years as a pastor, that's what I know. That's what I've seen. The statistics are always faithful and true to, to that. When you're out of fellowship with the church, you eventually get out of fellowship with the Lord because the Lord, that is his body. That is his bride. He loves his bride. Number three, I can study the Bible on my own. Now, don't you lie. That Bible has sat there at your at your at your. Uh, your little coffee table. And when you open the Bible, it's, and there's cobwebs everywhere. Or, well, I'll listen to the Bible as I'm driving to work, really? I mean, if that's for you, fine. But there's nothing like reading the Word of God. I can study the Bible on my own, and there are many who do do that. Now, hold on. I'm not being critical here. Just bear with me. Number four says, I have Christian friends that are my church. Really? Do, do y'all go out and make a difference in the community? Or do y'all just get together and sing a couple of songs and then say, hey, we had a good church service? No, a church is meant to make a difference in the community. That's what Grace Christian Center does. We have a K through 12 school here. We're always doing things out here. We're always being involved. We're trying to draw the community into what we do. We send, as a group, we send money to missions, to Samaritan's Purse, to India. We do things as a church together. And that's why God gets the glory, not a couple of us. God does. Number five, I have to work on sa Sundays. Well, that's true. Some of us t sometimes do. And so I'm not saying you have to be at church every single Sunday. But if the Lord says be there, you need to be there. Amen. You know, I look at my son and my daughter-in-law, for example, a registered nurse and a police officer. Uh, they work every other Sunday. But that every Sunday that they do not work, they are here. Why? Because they love the Lord and they love God's people and they serve. God's not trying to get you to be religious about this. But if, if you're at home doing nothing and the church is gathering, if there's no conviction there, hmm. Number six. I have family obligations on the weekends. There is nothing greater than bringing your family to the church. When I grew up, all of my baseball games were played on Saturdays. But you see, the devil is crafty and knows this. So back when I was playing baseball in the 1930s, I'm getting old. I know I don't look it, but I am. Our games were played on Saturdays. Now, on Sunday mornings, you hear these kids right over here screaming their heads off. That is the altar of worship. Kids are being sacrificed, playing games all day Sunday. There has to be a day that we just say it, it is dedicated for the Lord. There has to be. There has to be a day for that. Because we do so much. We're so busy. We're getting pulled to the left and to the right. And yes, we should honor the Lord every day. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there's nothing greater then when you bring your family to church instead of sending them to sea world there's times for vacations there's times to get for to going out and doing things but there's also time that has to be dedicated to the lord amen number seven i feel like church is boring sadly this is true there are a lot of churches that are boring but if you're in this church and you're bored that's not my fault that's your fault 
because the Holy Spirit is in this church and the Holy Spirit don't entertain you. The Holy Spirit will keep you alive. The Holy Spirit will keep you revitalized. The Holy Spirit will keep you in the passion of Christ. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But there are some churches that are boring. They sing the same songs with no faith. Now, it's okay to sing the same songs, but you have to do it with faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we gather to please God, not each other. We are not called to entertain each other. We are called, we are called to praise God. Number eight, I don't feel like there's a place for my child or teenager. And so guess what? You're not the only one. A lot of kids, they don't feel that's their place. But yet you feel comfortable to send them to the public school where so many demons are, where so many teachers are, are molesting these kids more and more and more and more. But yet you make that excuse up. We need to stop making excuses and we need to start. You know, some people say, well, you know, there's not that many people that go to church. Well, guess what? If we would all who believe in Christ would change our minds. So, you know, what? I'm going to go. You'd be surprised if they changed their mind and had the same attitude. The churches would be full. There would be more volunteers. There would be more kids in the church if we would just stop making excuses. But guess what? So many make the same excuse. Number nine. I don't feel like going to church makes a difference in my life. What you're saying is the body of Christ does not make a difference in your life. What you're saying is there's no power in the church. When Jesus says the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church, you're calling Jesus a liar when you're saying church doesn't make a difference in your life. You're calling Jesus a liar because Jesus says all power is in his church. Number 10, I don't know of any good churches near me. Sadly, this is true. This is true. That's why some, some, of, some of you watch online. Little by little, more and more churches are going the way of lukewarm and complacency. But God is still faithful. There are good churches out there. Number 11, I'm not sure I believe the same things anymore. Why? Because you've been out of fellowship. The church hasn't changed. The message of Jesus has not changed. You've changed. Now you want to add and take away the word of God when the book of Revelation says, if anyone adds or takes away from the words of this book, God shall do so unto you. Just because society says a girl's a boy and a boy's a girl, and just because society says there's different genders does not mean that God agrees with that. Now I'm not picking on homosexuality and transgenderism. All sexual immorality is wrong. If a man sleeps with a woman and they are not married, it is just as wrong as any other sexual sin. Sexual sin is sexual sin. Period. Number 12, I'm offended by the church's position on sexuality. Well, there you go. So what did I do? What, 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 did the, what did the Lutheran denomination do? They split up. They have two different ones now. What the, same with the Episcopal Church. They split up. They have some that, that do not ordain clergy, homosexual clergy. Some do. And the same it is with now, sadly, the evangelical churches. They're going that way. I've been hurt. Number 13, I've been hurt by church members. Guess what? I've hurt others and others have hurt me too but I'm still here. And for some of you who know me, I ran from this call for 15 years. I knew I was called to be a pastor and I, didn't, I disobeyed God for 15 years. Now I've been a pastor for 15 years. I should be in my 30th plus year of ministry. And there's hurt that goes on the body, in the body of Christ. But Jesus was hurt most of all. But yet he's, he was on that cross and he said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. And you have, to, if you're following Christ, then you also have to have the same mind as Christ and the same attitude as Christ. And when others hurt you, you have to say, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. I've had to do that and others have had to do that towards me because sometimes I've hurt others too. That's no excuse. It's not gonna work in God's book. It's just not. Number 14, I don't trust church leadership. Yeah, neither do I. That's why in this church, we have structured up now where, you know, we, we have safeguards towards things. 
you know, for the longest I had to deal with the finances. Now I'm glad I don't have to deal with finances. I don't have to count money. I don't have to deal with money. I don't have to do all that. Was it a temptation to me? No, it was not. But it, you don't want to give the devil any kind of foothold. And plus, you want to be transparent about a lot of things in the church. Because there's so much rock star preachers out there. There's so much stealing from, from, from the sheep. And, and, and they're enhancing their own lifestyle. There's nothing wrong with anyone any Christian, whether they're in ministry or not, there's nothing wrong with them having a nice home, a nice car, but do they honor God and are they faithful stewards? But you cannot use this, I don't trust church leadership, even though you have the ammo to say, yep, there's a lot of bad church leadership out there. Number 15, I don't feel like there's a place for me to lead. Yeah, when you go into a lot of churches, they just have the door shut for no one else to get involved because they just have their little thing going, that's not the church of Christ. The doors are open for anyone who wants to be involved and make a difference. Come and let the Lord heal you, save you, transform you, and anoint you. There's a place for everyone to serve here at Grace Christian Center. Answer the call. Look at 1 John 1, 5 through 7. John says this, as an old man, the apostle John says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Do we all agree on that? You better, because it's the Bible. Amen? There's no darkness in him at all. Look at verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with God, him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, Christian, you will make mistakes in your life, but this is talking about living in a habitual lifestyle of sin. If you continue to make the same sins over and over and over, you're lying. You're walking in darkness. You're not practicing the truth. You're not in fellowship with God. You hear me? But look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. This is just one proof of the text that, that says we're truly saved. It's because we walk with each other. We have fellowship with each other. We take joy in coming together as the church and doing things together, whether it's a service like this or whether it's dinner or, you know, the young adults, they get together on Thursday nights and they, they talk and have movies and watch and just things or talk and they do all this. Stuff. I don't want to get involved, you know. They got a totally different mindset, you know. And I'm kidding. I'm, I'm playing. They don't. Uh, you know, I'll go in there and I'll listen to them talk about something and I'm like, oh, okay. And, and I'll just ease my way back out of it because, you know, they're, they're in a really deep conversation and they're growing. That's good. That's what I love about the young adults here, that they talk about, you know, things and that, that we should all be talking about. And so there's good fellowship going on. The seniors, they come together and they talk about, about things and have a good, nice little fellowship as well, too. And so it, it's good when we come together. We have fellowship with each other. And we're, we're the, the, the true biblical word of God is being spoken by the leadership of, of the church. And, and then, you know, that's a healthy church. That's the church you want to be a part of. There's no perfect church. There's absolutely no, and there, We're not perfect here either. But that is what you want to be a part of. And you want to see things grow. And only God can make things grow. Only God can make a church grow. And only God can make things grow in your life. you got to give him a place to do it, though. Matthew 18, 18 through 20. Jesus says, Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You hear that? We have the power. This is the power, the authority that's given to the church that heaven could come to this earth for the glory of God only. When we face the devil, when we face trials and tribulations, in the power of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we can go forward and we can conquer the kingdom of Satan. Do you believe that today? Because hell is coming against you today. You see what's happening in the world. And the world is crying out for the Messiah. The world is crying out for peace and for, for healing. And the church is the one that is responsible to bring that message. Jesus says again, I say to you, <clears throat> excuse me, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, 
I am there in the midst of them. Two or three constitutes a church. It's not one, but it's two or three. You can't do this on your own. When you come together to pray and you pray in alignment with the will of God, in the will of God, it'll come to pass. Guaranteed. You're praying for your loved ones to be saved. You're praying for, for, for things that you know that are in alignment with the biblical word of God. They'll come to pass. Two or three are gathered. Meaning when you come together in the church and pray like this, it's happening. That's why we pray periodically. We'll have an all night prayer service this Friday night. Join us 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. here in the sanctuary. Pray all night. Jesus says, my house should be a house of prayer. There are times when Jesus had to pray all night because of the moment that he was in. He was getting ready to go to the cross. He had to pray all night. If the Son of God had to do this, don't we? What gives you an excuse? Oh, Jesus did it because he was God. No, he was in the flesh like you and I. And there are times that this is what we're talking about. You, you say you want to follow Christ? You say you want to be, you, you are a disciple of Christ? Then live like it. Be led by the Holy Spirit. We're, God is not impressed by his praying all night, okay? We do it because Jesus did it. And Jesus proved the point that sometimes, periodically, you go through things in this world where God wants to move, but God is waiting for you to call out to him because God will always honor your free will. And if your free will doesn't drive you to seek him, what do you expect God to do? Jesus said it, my house shall be a house of prayer. That means that you, you are his house. Your body is the temple of Christ. You should be a man, a woman of prayer. And you should belong to a church that believes in being a house of prayer. In Acts 2, 42 through 47, as I bring to a close here in just a moment, look at what the church looked like in the beginning. And this is my opinion. We need to finish the way the church began. This is not the church today you see throughout the United States of America. Look, Acts 40, 2, 42 through 47. Look, watch this. All the believers, this is how they were in the beginning. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. You hear that? They believed in what their pastors were saying because they knew it was the biblical word of God. But they had the spirit of God in them. They loved to gather together and eat together and they loved to come together and pray. When's the last time we come together and pray, you come together and pray with the church or you just come and do your Sunday thing? Is that, if that's your Christianity, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. That's not the way of Jesus. Verse 43, a deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miracles, miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. We, we have trouble just coming on a Sunday. They did it every day. They sold their property and possessions with, uh, and the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. The things you own, are you willing to just freely give away so that the needs of others can be met? A lot of people say, well, I have a need. I have a need. You know what? We're living in the most prosperous country in the history of the world, United States of America. But yet, I will tell you this. America is the number one place needed for the preaching of the gospel. If you want to be a missionary, this is it right here. It's not Africa. It's no longer China. It's no longer none of those nations. The greatest place that needs missionaries is right here in America. You know what missionaries would do in old days? The churches would send them out. They'd go to that foreign land. They would get a job. And then they would work the job. And then they'd go preach the gospel, share in the time that they had. That is what missionaries did. Hey, that is what we can do here too. 
You have a job. But is your life about being a missionary in spirit? I believe all of us are called to be missionaries. All of us. We have something to offer. It's the gospel of Christ. And we're, we work and we're able to help meet the needs of others. That's a missionary work. We're, we're not called to just go do our job, pay our bills, um, you know, have a little fun, and then come to church every Sunday and just, that is not the spirit-filled life. It's not. It's just not. And that's why the Bible says that in heaven, he's going to wipe away every tear because there are going to be a lot of believers in heaven that are going to see the opportunities they, they could have had to make a difference in people. And there's going to be a great crying in heaven. And God's going to wash their tears away. They're saved, but their loved ones that they could have ministered to will be in the eternal place of separation. Your Christian life, it's not about you. It's about others. The cross of Jesus, it was not about him. It was about you. It was about others. And the cross that you carry, it's not about you. It's about others. You get what I'm saying? It's about fellowship. It's about being a part of something that is bigger than your very life. The body of Christ. And we don't get that through our thick heads. We're not going to touch the glory of God. We're not. I mean, we, we, the church today is so hung up on theatrics, hanging from the chandeliers, you know, trying to teach others to speak in tongues and trying to do all these things. And there's not, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are there, but they're in an order for its proper place. We should be involved in seeking the holiness and the righteousness in the fear of God. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, one more verse, Acts 4, 32 through 35. Look at, look at the rest of the church in the beginning. All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them, and they would bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Now, people will do that today, but woe to those people because in their pulpits are, are sheep in wolves' clothing. They steal the money, and they go and buy them million-dollar jets and million-dollar homes, and they do all this insane stuff. And then they stay. God is in this house. God is in this place. Those are the false churches. Now, God will honor you and bless you because you're doing it with the right heart. But there's a lot of false churches out there. And you need to be mindful of these things. You, you know, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Does this not concern us? I mean, we should be here because we, are, we want to see people healed from a broken society. And there are a lot of broken people out there. You are a Christian. You're not broken. You may be battling with fear. You may be battling with some kind of anxiety. You may be battling with some kind of depression. But you're not broken. The blood of Jesus has healed you. And you're called to go out there and be a salt and light of the earth. You're called to be his hands and his feet. You're called to make a difference. You can make a difference for the glory of God. You can make a difference. It's not just my job, the preacher. It's all of our jobs because all our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're all called to go out and make a difference. And my last text, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31. The human body has many parts, <clears throat> but many parts make up one whole body. And so it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit. And we all share the same spirit. What does it mean by being slaves? This was written in a time when slavery existed. Clear and simple. Verse 14. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it. 
How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the, to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts that do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. The first are apostles, prophets, teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gifts of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who speak in unknown languages. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. Now what most of you don't know is that the very next chapter is called the chapter of love. And it's about love. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of angels and men, but have not love, I'm pointless. I'm just a, 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 a noisy symbol. That's what's missing in the church. The love. If you love God, You'll love his church. You'll love his will to be done. And that's what Jesus said. I come to do the will of my father. And that is in our hearts, in our spiritual DNA. We are about the will of our father. Look, I know one day you by yourself, me by myself, I'm going to stand alone with Jesus and I'm going to give an account of my Christian life. And there is no hiding anything. Some of you have been called and anointed to do some very great things for the Lord. And I just want to encourage you to stop running and to start fulfilling what God has wanted to do in your life. We have not much time left. We have not much time. But it all begins by going to church. It all begins. In June 8th of 2003, on a Sunday morning, as I was drunk, I looked at the Lord myself in the mirror and I said to the Lord I give up I'm not doing this no more I'll, I'll do what you want me to do Lord I'll be a Jesus freak I'll be a holy roller I'll do whatever you want me to do Lord and the Lord said take a shower you stink and so I took a shower I woke up my wife at that time we'd been married 10 years and we had never not one single time ever been to church and I woke her up and I said we're going to church she was actually a Jehovah Witness at the time she was raised Jehovah Witness. And we went to church that Sunday morning and we went to a full gospel church and it freaked her out. And she told me in the car, don't you ever take me to a place like this again. Well, you know, God has a sense of humor. And a month later, she gave her life to the Lord. And, 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 and I said, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. And the Lord said, go to that church over there. I went there for nine months. And then the Lord said, okay, now go to this church over here where you're going to get trained up as a pastor. And I went there for a little over three years. And I did it because you see that in the text. It takes about three years to come under a, a church, under a pastor's wing, to really get developed, to get out there and to do things. And, I, I, and people were telling me from the very beginning, because they knew the call of God in my life. Oh, Michael, you should start a church. You should start a church. I'm like, no, no. I need to do this God's way. And you need to do this God's way. Don't be in a rush. God knows exactly what he's doing and his timing is perfect. But I just want to encourage you and you watching online, some of you have been watching because you're afraid to go to a church because of COVID and all this. But I'm telling you, God is not giving you a spirit of fear. Amen? God's not giving you a spirit of fear. Yes, there is sickness out there. Yes, people very close to me have died from this sickness. 
but we are about to be the work of our Father. And don't give in to that fear. And get involved. Because that's why we go to church. Because Jesus is there.